Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. Africa's growth and its future prospects came under the spotlight this week with a high-level conference in Johannesburg and the release of new economic forecasts and statistics. Terence Creamer joins me to discuss some of the key issues arising. The 8th Annual African Economic Conference took place this week with a strong focus on regional integration. That's correct. I think the message or the mantra around regional integration has really been around for a very long time, uh, decades in fact. But I think there's a, a growing seriousness around the need to accelerate regional integration. There's still a number of political and economic uh, constraints to, to this. Uh, there's still rivalry within the continent that uh, impedes progress on regional integration. But I think as the world economy recovers from the Great Recession, more and more uh, countries are seeing that there are impediments to pursuing an export-led growth path alone. And that's really where Africa is at the moment. We have sort of mine to port type infrastructure. We're really focused about getting our commodities, often for many countries, a single commodity to the growing Chinese market or uh, other emerging markets that are demanding those commodities. And, you know, there's a, there's a change in the growth tra trajectory. In the, you know, we know that the developed world is in a very difficult spot and is going through structural adjustments. But even in the uh, emerging markets that really got us through the great financial crisis um, and kept the growth going, there's a change in the way those economies are going to uh, behave and of the way they're going to grow in future, with China looking much more domestically, looking at the consumer rather than purely at investments. And that investment-led growth was very commodity intensive. So the view is that we really need as Africa to look at that and understand that we need to uh, also pay attention to our own domestic market. And our domestic market is currently broken up into 50 plus countries, which you know makes trade and uh, investment difficult because we just don't have the, the critical mass in terms of markets and consumer. And then we don't have the linkages between each other. So there's this view that we really need to pay attention to getting uh, in different blocks initially. Uh, the uh, First, that infrastructure, that critical infrastructure, the north-south infrastructure, not just the, the pit-to-port type infrastructure, but the ones that link the roads and the transmission networks and the uh, power projects that can you know, link across borders. We need to get those going because that, more than tariff barriers, etc., uh, or, you know, are, are real constraints. But then there is also the issue of trade facilitation. We still have these you know, terrible situations at borders where trucks, you know, pile up for days on end to get across certain borders. And, um, you know, the African Development Bank uh, um, suggests that it's almost like having a situation where you have South Africa, nine province, provinces broken into nine different countries. And you can imagine if that were the case and we had to stop every time we had to cross the Vol River, you know, or uh, into a different province. You know, it's, it's a real... Uh, a difficult situation in terms of facilitating trade and, and really getting the most out of our proximity to these markets. So I think it was a big focus and the issue was really an appeal to those that are putting up. You know, you know, there are going to be some countries that won't benefit as much because of their nature of development from an integrated uh, platform. But ultimately, that integrated platform will pay off for everyone. So we need to try and find ways to start dealing with those constraints. The IMF also released its regional economic outlook for sub-Saharan Africa this week. That's right. You know, interestingly, you know, we, you know, most countries are looking at uh, again growing post the, the economic crisis, but that's really slow and anemic. And South Africa, being you know within that camp, we're only looking at two percent this year, and it's really not going to pick up to the levels that we really need to deal with our social const and economic constraints in this country. But at least in the region as a whole, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, those countries, the IMF, I think that you know, despite many headwinds this year and commodity prices have come under pressure, etc., the, um, the growth across the continent is going to be around 5%. If you had stripped South Africa out of that, it would have been closer to 6% for this year. And next year they see, again, Sub-Saharan Africa uh, you know, carrying on and maintaining a good growth momentum of around 6.5%, uh, 6%, and it would have been you know, close to 6.5% without South Africa 
because of our slow, the, no, the slow growth that we're experiencing in Africa's largest economy. So, you know, the continent's story is still one um, of, uh, of growth. But I think, again, the African Development Bank made a good point this week, is that this, is gro this growth is a turning point so, for Africa. So, you know, we ha we've had a situation of decades of stagnation. We are at least out of that. Uh, uh, but it doesn't mean we've got into a sustainable development turning point where we can say we're really on track to a whole different, you know, uh, experience as Africans. You know, most Africans still live in very poor conditions. The infrastructure is not good. You know, the, uh, the education, more and more Africans are going to school, but there's still the quality issues around health, education, etc. So, we, you know, the, 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 the whole change is important, you know, the fact that Africa is growing, but then a lot needs to be done uh, to manage it in, in, into a sustainable development future where we can start really sharing the benefits of this economic growth. And um, I think that the IMF and others are making that point as well. And they're also just, just flagging a few possible internal and external headwinds for next year. You know, there's always the political issues in Africa and uh, there are conflicts that need to be resolved. There's also the issue of weather. Uh, you know, food security is very weather dependent in Africa. Um, and then there's a lot of external uh, risks. And I think the biggest external risk is, you know, the change in nature of growth in the rest of the world and what that's going to mean for commodity prices. And if commodity prices come under pressure for a sustained period, it is going to impact uh, sub-Saharan Africa's uh, growth uh, in, the next, in the coming few years. But the view is that there are also uh, local support factors that are going to keep the growth ticking over. But, but we're going to have to watch that com those commodity prices quite closely. What, in your view, are some of the key themes emerging for decision makers and business people in South Africa? I think the, the key theme is we need some successes on the cross-border front. I think uh, Minister, uh, Finance Minister Pravin Gordon made this point this week as well. We need to see some real tangible successes on the cross-border uh, projects, whether, whether those be power transmission projects, uh, power generation that's being exported uh, into other countries, uh, road uh, infrastructure that's north, north and south, rail, water projects. I think we need to start seeing that as well as seeing a lot more one-stop border shops, uh, border posts that you know really facilitate the transportation of uh, uh, goods across borders in Africa, as well as you know hopefully building uh, a regional supply chain so that it's not just final product exported from, through South Africa or from South Africa into the rest of the region. Uh, that there's actually some components coming into maybe South African factories or, comp or inputs from South African factories going into African factories. And we're still at the early stages of that, but that's really going to be about infrastructure. And I think we need to see some of some serious progress around that. Then there's the mindset. Again, it was the point was made that the, generally the political leaders are on side. Regional integration is a flavor of the month, of the moment. Um, but the, there's often, you know, it doesn't always filter down to the bureaucracy. So we need that mindset that this is a, a, a important win-win for everyone to to get through right through the levels of uh, officialdom in Africa, because that's where the constraints can really happen. So th there's a lot that needs to be done there. There's, that mindset is not there. In fact, you know, there's a lot of rhetoric around Africa unite, but when it comes to the reality, I think some people are quite concerned. Uh, that they want to protect what they've got. And uh, that can have uh, major consequences for actually getting deals signed. So we've seen, for instance, the trilateral free trade area, which involves SADC, Comesa, and ECA, really not uh, moving at the pace it should have. We're seeing signs that things are you know, on, on track, but not at, at the accelerated pace that we're hoping. ECOWAS in West Africa, I think, made an important statement in the last two weeks that they wanting to move towards a customs union. So there is that more of that political will, but I think we need it filtering right through the system. Um, and then from the business uh, side, I think uh, African business needs to get to understand the continent a lot better. I think there's a lot of progress has been made over the last decade. I think South African business is really getting its, its head around Africa. And I think, you know, just opening up, uh, you know, the mind to this growth and what can what it can mean. I think business needs to get uh, on board, and I think it is getting on board. And then, you know, there's just 
implementation of agreements that are already made. This point was also made this week. You know, you've got the Yamasukra Agreement, which goes back almost to the last millennium, <laughs> where uh, we should have had an open skies policy, which we should have had a much more liberalised uh, uh, air travel arrangement by now in Africa. And really, we just haven't seen the implementation of an agreement that's already in place. Um, and I think that the view is that, you know, if we just implemented some of these agreements, some of these constraints to travel within Africa, for instance, and the cost of travel in Africa would just come down much more uh, aggressively. So I think there's a number of things. There needs to be more urgency. We need to say, look, we have to look more towards our home markets, which is Africa, to our future growth, given what's happening in the rest of the world. And I think then business really tapping into those opportunities. And I think it's happening, but I think it's all about now picking up the pace. Thank you. That's the second tech show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis.